We're going to begin a brand new series today that I am calling a very simple name, just Reboot. All right, in our modern world, we are familiar with the term Reboot. Uh, we do this in our world all the time. How many of you have had to reboot something electronic? Come on, raise your hand. You've had to reboot the television, your smart TV, your U-verse, you, your internet router, your phone, your computer. You, you hit the restart button or however you do it. And, 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 and to reboot is to reload the operating system onto that electronic device and start it up again. And usually you have to reboot boot it after something isn't working just right. How many of you ever had difficulty with your phone? It froze up. It got locked and there was a malfunction in it, but you rebooted and you restarted and, and all of a sudden everything's working normally again. And so here's the point of this series, all right? Sometimes our spiritual lives need to be rebooted. Come on. What is true in the natural world sometimes is true in the spiritual world. And, and sometimes we, in a very real sense, need to stop, shut down for a moment, and, and then start again. And as we do so, we will begin to function at a better level with the full operating system that the Lord has for us. And so as we begin this brand new year of 2020, there are some areas in our lives that we need to reboot. Come on. You may need to reboot your prayer life, all right? It may have gotten on slow mode during the holidays. Listen, you need to focus on prayer over the next few weeks, uh, uh, you know. And so maybe you need to reboot your attitude. Come on, has anybody ever needed to reboot their attitude? You know, some negativity creeps in, some griping, some complaining, and, and that begins to slow down your operating system, spiritually speaking. How many of you track it with me today? You may need to reboot your mind through the Word of God, through renewing your mind. Some of you may need to reboot your home where your home is functioning and, and it's a place of joy, a place of blessing, a, a place where, where there's life and happiness and, and good times there. You may need to reboot your marriage or your relationships or your service to God. So I want you to join me as we begin this series. We're going to jump right into the Word today in Revelation chapter 2. All right, I want to talk to you today about a church that needed a spiritual reboot. Okay, Jesus had John write seven letters to seven churches on his behalf, all right? Now, if this church that we're going to look at had been judged by outward appearances only, by the things that they were doing, they, they were commended greatly. I mean, this church looked good. I'm talking about the church at Ephesus, okay? Uh, but, and this church had a lot of good qualities. But let me just read to you how Jesus commended them for their good qualities, all right? Are you me. This is what Jesus said. He said, I know your works. How many of you know the Lord knows our hard work for Him? Anything that you do for the Lord, the Lord sees it. Even if it's just giving somebody a cup of cold water in the name of Jesus. He sees that and He says you're going to get a reward for it. Amen? He says, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not and have found them liars and you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my namesake and have not become weary. Wow, that's a great church, don't you think? It looks like it. Uh, you know, I don't know what you think of when you read those words, but I see a pretty amazing church right there. I'll be proud the pastor a church like that after receiving such a review. I mean, they were a laboring church. These people were busy for the Lord, okay? They, they had good activities to do. They were doing all the things that churches do, outreach and evangelism and praise and worship and, and prayer, and, and they were hardworking people for Jesus. They had labored in the name of Jesus and had not grown weary, and they also kind of had a sense of right and wrong. How many of you see that in, as you read that? They were moral people, Okay, they, these were, 
These weren't people that couldn't discern, you know, the good from the bad. It says that they couldn't bear those who were evil. And they recognized even the guys who went around pretending to be somebody that they weren't pretending to be apostles. They recognized all of that. And the thing I like about them is weren't quitters. I mean, you know, that's a good thing in a church. These guys had persevered and not given up. That tells me they'd been through some tests, some trials, maybe some attacks of the enemy come on, some opposition had come, but these guys had patience, and they, they, they lived in a culture that was very wicked. If you study about the ancient city of Ephesus, you'll know that it's a hustling, bustling trade city with a giant temple to a false god named Artemis, and there was a lot of immoral worship of Artemis that went on around there but this group had separated themselves from that they were persevering they were hard working but the Jesus knew that and, 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 and as commendable as all of that was they were still not functioning with their complete operating system, okay? Uh, there was something that wasn't right. They needed a spiritual reboot. While everything on the outside looked okay, there was a hard issue that they needed to deal with, and that was that this church had lost their first love for Jesus. And so Jesus goes on and he challenges them. And he says this in verse 4. He says, nevertheless. In other words, he's committed them for all these things. He says, nevertheless, I have this against you that you have lost your first love. It's like a wife, okay, that comes to her husband and, and she says, you know, honey, I, I know you're working hard and, you know, if you were in, in Minnesota, you would say, you've been shoveling the snow and you've been warming up my car and, and you know, you've been making me coffee. I don't know if guys do this or not. And you've been doing all this stuff and, 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 uh, and you know, and you've been working so hard, paying the bills, but I just feel like we're not connecting. There's not that love that we used to have. Uh, you know, and that, that's what Jesus was saying. All the good you've been doing, the work, the perseverance, the separation from the world, all of that is good and wonderful and okay. But Jesus says, I have something against you because you, we, you, we've just lost, you've left that pay, place of first love. And I think what Jesus is saying both to this church and to you and me today, he, he's saying that he's saying he doesn't want for us to lose that sense of love, that flow flows between Jesus and his forever family. And the scripture tells us this. It tells us that God is love. Come on, tell your neighbor God is love. The scripture just plainly says God is love. And I'll have you know that God enjoys us, his children loving him. This was obviously something that was very important to the heart of Jesus. Not just that we do things, but how we do things, why we do things. Is it driven and motivated by love? And we see the love of God and the desire to, for Him to be with His people all the way back in the garden with Adam and Eve when, Adam, when God used to come down in the, in the garden in the cool of the day. Come on and be with them. They're, God is a God of love and, and we need to understand that. And so we want to, you might be saying, well, pastor, what is first love? The first love for a Christian is the devotion to Christ that so often characterizes actually a, a new believer. You know, new believers in Christ are often very fervent. It's very personal to them. They're, they're very uninhibited and, and excited and openly display their love for Jesus. Because you see, how many of you realize Christianity isn't a religion? It's not a religion. We're not about religion at Fountain of Life, okay? Christianity is not a set of rules that a person adheres to. Christianity is not a duty and an obligation that somehow, you know, if we work hard enough, we can fulfill it. Christianity is not something that after church on Sunday, you kind of check that box off and say, well, I did my Christian thing for the week. Oh, no, 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 no. Christianity at its core is a relationship with God. It's a relationship that is based on God's love for us. And it all started because God first loved us. This whole love thing between humanity and God began in the heart of God as God loved humans. Amen. I love 1 John chapter 4 and verse number 19. It says this, we love Him because He first loved us. Amen. Let me tell you something. Jesus loved you before you loved Him. 
Come on. I said Jesus loved you before you loved him. The scripture says this. While we were still sinners, he loved us. Come on. While we were unlovable, while we were doing things where we really didn't deserve love, while our lives were in a mess, and maybe your life is still in a mess today, that's okay. I've got good news for you today. God loves you. Come on, somebody. Amen. Amen. I'm so grateful for the cross. Because that shows us, it proves to us the very love of God. You see, God, God started this love thing. And he sent Jesus to die in our place that we could have a relationship with him that wasn't based on obligation. That wasn't based on, I don't know how many laws from the Old Testament, 670 something, whatever. I'm glad we have a relationship with God that's based on love. Come on, can we give him a big praise today? And let me tell you, when you love God, you want to be with Him. <laughs> Worship isn't uh, some obligatory duty. Okay, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, have, I'll do it because I had No, no, you want to worship Him. Come on. Amen. Having a devotional time isn't, isn't hard because you actually want to spend time with Him. And you sing. And, and let me tell you, not, how many of you know that singing isn't just about church? Come on. I know... See, it sings all day long, every day. My wife sings all the time. Come on. And let me, it's just, it's something that comes from the heart. You just want to express your love to the Lord. Amen. And spend time with Him. I read a story this Christmas season that got a hold of me and kind of reminds me of the heart of God towards us. Maybe you've heard it. There was a widower and, and his daughter, his only daughter. They lived together and every night, uh, you know, he was a farmer, and after they'd worked so hard, and, you know, the daughter came home from school, and, and, you know, from her studies, they would sit beside the fire, and they would talk of the day and spend the evening together, and then, you know, at the close of the day, they would, you know, go to bed, and, and uh, but the time came when this daughter, after, you know, evening tea, maybe they were British, I don't know, but after evening tea, uh, clearing up and so on, she would only sit just a few moments, and then... She would disappear from sitting with her father at the fire and go up into her room. And, and he was a little perturbed at that, you know. And but he was thinking about all of this. And he thought, well, you know, she's getting older. And maybe it's just a bit cringeworthy for her to have to, you know, be here with me every single night. And you know, maybe she needs to study more, has other things to do. And he tried to make excuses for her. But he was really pained uh, by all of this. And so the weeks transpired and passed by and finally Christmas came and one Christmas and on Christmas morning his only daughter came down the stairs and presented him with a gift and and uh, he she opened it up to and realized that she had made him a beautiful pair of leather slippers and and uh, so, you know, he, he was touched by that. And he, that he, she had night after night, very painstakingly with loving devotion, prepared this gift for him. And tears started to stream down his face. And he thanked her. And this is what he said to his daughter. He said this. He said, I thank you for this gift of these slippers, but I would rather have had you than the slippers. Think about that for just a moment. Wow, that's the way our Heavenly Father thinks of us. You know, we get busy. We work for the Lord. We're on the praise team. We're praying. We're doing all kinds of stuff. And God the Father's just saying, listen, that's wonderful. Thank you for all of that. But He's saying, listen, what I really want is for you to sit with me. Come on. How many of you believe that's the way our Father is? God is looking for our love. And the most, the best way you can express love for anybody is by giving them T-I-M-E. Right? You give them time. If you love your children, what do you give them? You give them your time. If you love your spouse, what do you give them? You better give them some time. Come on. 